and welcome to the first episode of Pod Against Evil. Because <laughs> no one said I was clever at uh, at making titles. I still go with Stand By Me. Stand By Me. Stand By uh, Evil. You know, yeah. Stand By Me, while grown worthy in its punny- punniness, is kind of growing on me. <laughs> like, who... <laughs> Like, maybe we actually might play, uh, maybe we can get Kyle to, to write us a different version of Stand By Me that's really creepier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but who is talking uh, some really horrible pun work that they are going to try and make into a musical format? Why, it's me, Nick, the Merc with a mic. And uh, normally this would be the point where I'd introduce my fellow unapologists, but this is not that podcast. I'm I'm actually I'm panicking wh- here. Wh- what do you call Stand Against Evil fans? Stannies? Ugh, that doesn't that sound right. No, no that, that sounds like something awful. else. That sounds that's, like it's probably something else already that you don't want to be. No, that's no, that's no good, man. We'll have to think of a name. Mm. Man, I didn't like. Man, I didn't think this through. Evil lights. Yeah, if evil lights. I don't know. Yeah, that's not going to help with the Ash against the Evil Dead comparison. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> what what comparisons? In what way? I mean, I I can't think of how this show is similar in any way. No. Uh, but you know what? Let's just uh, go around and introduce our our fellow fa- my fellow fans of Stand Against Evil. We'll start with my regular co-host on our uh, my our UGO podcast as well as our Netflix and Kills. My partner in crime, Travis over here. Say mm. hi, Travis. Hi, Travis. And of course, I always we've got to want to mention uh, our good friend, friend of the pod, uh, and now co-host of uh, our own separate pod, Les Les Weiler. Want to say hi, Les? Hey, hi, Les. Uh, yep. Glad to be here. <laughs> For those of you listening, tuning in, I assume you're Stand Against Evil fans. But if not, uh, I will just run down the <laughs> description of Stand Against Evil and what it is. Stand Against Evil is a show that I quite enjoy. It is about a aging uh, <laughs> sheriff of a town that has to relinquish his position to a new sheriff after his wife has died and he kind of has... I don't know, lost lost a couple steps. He can't really get his life together. Had a slight altercation with an older lady. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, but these two, uh, you know, the previous sheriff and the new sheriff have to team up once it is found out that the <laughs> these demon uh, witches are have have cursed not only the the town or but the position of sheriff, and they have to work together to kind of fight these. What was it? 172. Thanks. Yeah. 172, 172 witches. Demons. Demons. Specifically yeah. demons. <laughs> so that's the the basic setup. Now, I kind of wanted to go around. Uh, well, you know what? First, I wanted to explain like why we're doing the podcast. And why is because I, I was actually inspired by our, our friend Les here. Um, because him and his, uh, his other friend, TV, TV dude, Randy got me hooked on episode by episode podcasts to the point where I kind I kind of wanted to do one myself. Uh for those of you who don't know, Les does a uh, uh, a podcast called Middleman which well, it's, hopefully uh, will be It's actually called The Good Die Young. Uh but oh. the first season of it is The Middleman. Uh, I'm I'm going to go through shows that uh that were just too pretty to live and and only made it through like one season and uh but the the first one out the gate is going to be all about The Middleman. Sorry, that's right. The good die young, and hopefully that will be up by the time this is posted as well. I, I don't oh, know. So I'm good. not sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Frantically when editing this, now, so yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. This, this will. Uh, I'm not sure when this will go up. Hopefully, before. Uh, you know, I'm hoping a week or two before the Stand Against Evil season two starts back up mm. again to get a little timely in it. But you know what? I, what I want to have happen and what actually happens rarely coincide. Yeah, it's a little ambiguous. Uh. <laughs> But yeah, I, I was wrecking my brain because I wanted to do a podcast about a TV show breaking down an episode by episode, but I was wondering like, okay, well, what show can I do that doesn't have like, I don't know, five other podcasts already dedicated to it, like, you know, Game of Thrones does, mm. or Firefly, or like, you know, the the standards. And I'm like, oh, well, okay, I can do, ooh, I can do like, I was thinking maybe I can do Young Justice since that's coming back. True. That Eventually also has a couple point. podcasts about it, though. I was thinking maybe Justified. You know how much I love Justified. You do love Justified. Oh, there's so much of that show to cover, though. I know. That was the, what's was keeping me from covering Justified, is that there's seven seasons of Justified. Like, I mean, I'd, I'd love to go through Deadwood, but it'd take the rest of my life. 
I know. And it's like, uh, I, I should pick something that I like that is relatively on the shorter consumable. end. Consumable. <laughs> that is consumable <laughs> and it is really like fun, uh, fun fare that I don't have to go maybe into super, super duper deep analysis on to kind of cut my teeth on. I didn't want to bite off more than I could chew. And so I was racking my brain on what I, I could do for that. And I came across Stand Against Evil, which I'm going to be completely honest. I thought like, uh, there's no way Stand Against Evil is going to get a season two. Yeah. When it first came out. It didn't they, seem like it was very well received. Um, no, well, that's, yeah. It, it I didn't hear a lot of uh, buzz about it. Like, I didn't know a lot of people that just flipped out about it. Um, and we can get into to some of the unfair reasons why I think that was. But yeah, I was really thrilled it got a season two. Well, it it was. I, I I'm I'm surprised as the marketing wasn't really uh there for it, or at least I didn't see a whole lot of marketing for it. It was on a channel that's kind of hard to get to mm-hmm. begin with. Uh, the yeah, I think we ended up watching like on your phone the first episode. Yeah, well the, the well they finally put out uh, the FC or IFC actually finally put out the uh, it, the whole whole thing on their app like a couple weeks after the whole thing aired, and now that's how I was able to yeah, that's how get I finally through. watched it. And and then they when they released it they actually released it two episodes at a time most mm-hmm. of the time and for those of you who don't consume TV regularly that's that's usually when they start burning multiple episodes at a time it's not a good sign. That, yeah that's, that's a burn usually, off yeah that's usually an indicator that the channel doesn't really care about like eh well we'll air it so that it can technically air and that's about it like it I was getting a lot of Firefly vibes mm, from it yeah. sweeping out of the rug. Yeah, two at a time is the point where I start as a fan going, all right, the best I'm going to get out of this is being grateful that I will actually see the last four produced episodes. Because, I mean, there's a lot of shows where they just don't air the last three. Like, oh, well, hopefully there's a DVD set someday. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, when they were doing, like, when I heard they were doing these two at a time, and, and it uh, it kind of feels like uh, like the Inhumans premiering on Friday. That's the, <laughs> day you, that's the night you move shows to to die. <laughs> to, di- to die, yeah. You don't start there. So yeah, when they started by dropping two at a time, I was like, mm. but I had the same feeling going with The Good Place, which also did a similar thing. Yeah, um, man, the, the Good Place also was another thought one that I thought like, man, they couldn't, they can't just go with this premise to a, another season two. Like it's it's too good. It's going to end on that cliffhanger mm-hmm. and not come back. And speaking of cliffhangers too, if this one, if this, if Stand Against Evil didn't get a second season, I would have, it's, it has one of those endings where you go like, God damn it. Really? Yeah. yeah it kind of flips the game on, on what's happening in the town a little bit. Yeah. It's one of the, yeah, it's one of those great shakeups that I was, I was ready for it to like never get answered. Like the riches for anyone who remembers the riches <laughs> by Les's laughter. I, I assume that he remembers. I very, yeah. Anything with Eddie Izzard. <laughs> Eddie Izzard, you you poor bastard. Why why can't you get a TV show that gets oh, it gets past so the season good. two? But yeah, so when I when the they had the announcement that Stand Against Evil was coming back for a season two that it got renewed, I was like, whoa, okay. Um, I thought that yeah, it would be definitely worth it to go back for a podcast and at least show that hey, there's a whole podcast dedicated to this show. If John just to someone's prove, watching, you know, just to prove to like that there is interest in it. And there was just a lot of things that drew me into doing this podcast, but I kind of want to go into a story before we just break down the first episode, which this will be uh, the first, you know, premiere episode of Stand Against Evil, uh, premiered on October 31st. Uh, I kind of wanted to go into how each of us discovered Stand Against Evil. Les, would you like to start? Sure. Um, this, uh, this was a show that I, had, like you were talking about, IFC is not a channel everybody has. I certainly don't have it. So there wasn't a way for me to watch it even when I found out it was going to happen, really. Uh, I knew I was going to have to track this down. And there just wasn't there wasn't enough buzz around it to put it on that list of like, I have to find a way to watch the premiere episode of this. So I just didn't I didn't see it for the longest time. And then it got endless comparisons to Ash versus Evil Dead, just in, in terms of premise. Um, I mean, and I get it. Like, you've got a gruff sheriff kind of guy that's got to fight. I mean, like it. It has a practical effect, deadite kind of vibe. I mean, I, I get why it got comparisons. I think I kind of wrote it off as like, oh well, I watched a couple episodes of Ash. It was okay. It wasn't. It didn't grab me like it did my friends. But I didn't go seek out Stand Against Evil because I think I kind of lumped them all in together of like, oh, and then realized. Uh, I think I was re-listening to uh, Randy's interview a year ago. I think with Janet Varney, and she talked where they were talking specifically about it about like I guess it was about to premiere, and how excited she was and the how much she liked the script and Dana Gould from Simpsons and 
all the practical effects they were going to do and how limited the CG was going to be and how old school monster it was going to be. And I got more excited about it and went and, and tracked it down. And I think that was around the time that they released it all. I think they finally put it on their app. And so I, I binge watched the, I didn't really expect to, but I ended up binge watching the whole first season kind of in probably three days. And uh, yeah, just fell in love with it. Like I, I couldn't believe how, how much more charming it was, how a lot of the stuff that I had read about as, uh, as, oh, this doesn't quite work or there's just not enough there. I really don't know what people were talking about, especially when I rewatched the pilot to record this today. There are so many tiny little things that build the tone of that town and they sneak up on you and start to click so that this show, I think by episode three, I was fully hooked and it wasn't for any one big thing they did. It's it's that they're setting up a deeper, creepier sh- or weirder show, not creepy so much, but uh, we can we'll talk a little bit later about Leon Drinkwater and uh, and uh, <laughs> Sheriff's daughter and or rather McGinley's daughter. Uh, <laughs> the supporting characters are so far past what they need to be that the the whole town really starts to come together for me and uh, and I, I came to really enjoy the show. I actually have had a similar experience because when we first started our podcast, our second episode ever, we tried to do a convention episode mm-hmm. we were at Daishokan. We met our patron saint, <laughs> 2015. And I decided that I, I was I was waiting for Janet Varney's panel, actually. Uh, I think it was Women in Comedy. Something like that. Something like that, yeah. And there was this really cute blonde in the line next to me as I was waiting for the previous uh, panel to get ditch out so that, you know, the in the next panel room could uh, could fill up. And I realized that the blonde waiting next to me was Janet Varney. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap. And then I had the idea in my head since she was like five feet away from me that I would ask her for an interview for my brand new podcast. And I think the if I had had a chance to think about it longer, I would not or have you asked would have her. voiced it to anybody else. I would not have voiced it like at all because I've been like, why would she ever want to talk to me? I'm nobody. Which is great that I didn't have ch- a chance to think about it because she immediately said yes. I was about to say she probably agreed to this. She's so nice. Mm-hmm. She, she is and the nicest. Supports nice- podcasting really. Oh yeah, and her podcast, the JV Club, is one of uh, my personal favorites. If you guys had a chance, she uh, interviews other uh, women in the industry and you know female comedians, actresses. Uh, voice actors and that sort of thing and they talk about like their their uh, embarrassing moments from their childhood <laughs> basically and she's man she's got a great interview technique as well because not only did I interview her that time but I, I interviewed interviewed her uh, about maybe eight months later for another for another episode via Skype and we talked about stand against evil both times and during one of them, she did mention like, well, I play the new sheriff and the old sheriff was John C. McGin- is John C. McGinley. And I'm like, stop right there. I'm going to watch it. <laughs> Are you telling me Dr. Cox is in this show? Yes. Yeah, it's just John C. McGinley getting to really hit his sweet spot. They wrote this part for him. If there was ever a part written for an actor more, uh, he is... He is fantastic in this. He uh, and I think John C. McGinley is a very underrated actor. I think he's you don't uh, see him in nearly enough. Well, I think most people know him as Doctor Cox, but right. he's actually in a lot more. Like, I mean, I was watching The Rock the other day, and I didn't realize he was a heavy mm-hmm. in there. He he played like the the big tough military dude. Hmm. People forget he's one of the Bobs from Office Space. Yeah, and he's he's great in Office Space. That's yeah. a great scene with him, and he's got this great physicality of his acting. Of where he's got the, the the opposite of the George Clooney, like where his head kind of it can can bobble or, along, but he doesn't look like a bobblehead mm-hmm. that's just out of out of control. He's always kind of like slightly mocking you just from doing it. Well, like when he thinks about something, like when he's like portraying thinking about anything, he can really portray that not only in his face but just the way his head tilts. Not only do I see that he is thinking, but I kind of get a sense of what he's thinking just based off the angle of his head. Mm. It's weird, but great head acting aside, <laughs> I, you know, I heard about it, you know, from from Janet herself, and I, you know, I ended up ended up watching the show, and I ended up binge watching it the same way Les did, and I think uh, that was after they did release the first episode. What was it? They released the first episode on Halloween, I think. Yep. 
and they that that was free to watch. So I think we all watched that one. Mm-hmm. I think me, me, you know, me, Kyle, and Travis, all the unapologists, we all watched it. And Travis did not catch up. They well, only watched the first one. And it wasn't even that it didn't draw me in. It did seem very interesting, but it just. Again, we live in such a time where there's so much media consume, and this one was like, this is very inconvenient to watch. Yeah. Like, we're all sitting huddled around a table on your phone, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, we live in a world where I get behind on Steven Universe, and I love Steven Universe more than any human probably just loves anything in this world. And I still get behind on it just because it's so inconvenient to keep up on and watch. Because mm-hmm. I have just like, I'm like, God damn it, where, where was it on Cartoon Network? Like, wait, you released two episodes in, in one month and then like nothing for the next six? Yeah. yeah. God Every once it. in a while, 30 Steven Universe episodes appear. And, and I watch all of them. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that seems to be how I ingest that show. So so yeah, I definitely understand. Like, like you said, it's, it's peak TV. Uh, there's so many things on that. And it's not just a matter of like, oh, I'd like to fill time with another show. Like mm-hmm. I'm picking and choosing winners from winners. I mean, like I'm ditching good shows to watch good shows. Yeah. No, we were just talking about this even in our previous episode where Nick tries to find something to fill in time. And I'm trying to fill his time with Gotham and that failed miserably because now we're sitting down watching all of Gotham. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fun. I mean, it's it's an Elseworlds. It's really fun it if really you is. view it as a DC Elseworlds. Uh, that is in no way leading up to Batman. <laughs> no. Yeah, there was a point where I was thinking of doing a Gotham podcast because of like how ridiculous. I'm like, oh my god! Like every episode, we're gonna talk about like the three sharks that jumps every episode. Mm-hmm. I would, I would love it. Um, yeah. So that's basically all of our exposures. How we got exposed to Stand Against Evil. Um, I'm actually really curious to know what what a person would be like if they just found it randomly on TV one time well, at one point. Hmm. Although I don't know anyone who just discovers TV shows like that anymore. Yeah. I am interested. I'm going to actually I'm going to see my dad next weekend and I'm I'm dying to know how exactly he found Preacher. Oh. Cuz I he did not read the comics. I I mean I it, it's it's my 50 something year old dad like Mm-hmm. He, he didn't read the comics. Uh, he didn't know there was a comic. I don't know how he found this show. I mentioned it during season one, and and my stepmom was like, "Oh, he loves that." I'm like, <laughs> how the <laughs> hell did he find that? Sh- what does he like about it? Like, yeah. So, so I've I, I'm dying to know. But yeah, I I wonder sometimes like who legitimately just still has cable and flips through and stumbles across TV shows and goes, "Oh, what is this?" Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't even remember the last time I even channel surfed. No, it's it's, it's like, a waste of time. Most of the time, a, it's a long dead memory. Does Wait, we not like, being able to find stuff in Hulu's new interface count as channel surfing? <laughs> just, I, it's the new form, I guess. Because I've scroll- watched three episodes of Orville simply because I can't find anything else in Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess our new version of it is to just scroll through the Netflix thumbnails and not mm-hmm. pick anything for an hour yeah, and a half. Because you know I, you're. Yes. If you're scrolling through Netflix, you know you're not going to watch anything on Netflix. <laughs> no, no, you're you're looking for something to remind you of a thing that's not on Netflix to go search for on another streaming network. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me, I'm old enough to uh, to remember watching the TV Guide channel in college. No. Dude. Uh, you were waiting for your one channel you were trying to see the schedule of to come around on the scroll, and inevitably someone would ask you a question or something, and you'd miss it. Yeah. And then you'd have to wait for the crawl again. Now, now I've missed. Uh, now I've missed channels two thirty three to two forty seven. Yes, God damn exactly, it! Exactly, exactly. How will I know what plays after Night Court? Come on. But yeah, with that out of the way, uh, I think we can just dig into the first episode of Stand Against Evil, the premiere. So, just to run it down, uh, it's got actually a really good opening, where we of course open in medias res, because. Uh, <laughs> Got to start your start your story as uh, as as late into the game as possible. Mm. Yeah, and Pretty so much the end of this episode really. Often I hate this plot setup, like this device. Very very often it does not work for me. Where I'm I'm just annoyed of like oh one week prior, but in this regard, given that they they go from like shit hitting the fan to like jump back to funeral. I don't know. There, there's something about jumping back to a morning event. That makes this device work for me of like, okay, I'm okay with with finding out that this gets off the rails in six days because the inciting event is is the kind of game changer like a a death. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of like it because it's kind of a bait and switch because the opening is, of course, Stan, we open up on, you know, on Willard's Mill in New Hampshire and Stan, our our, uh, John C. McGinley shows up. 
uh, with a shovel and a, a bag full of supplies. And he <laughs> sees this sign that says, uh, in our darkest hour, we commit these souls unsettled to graves unblessed. And he's got this great line of like, why is everything a goddamn poem? <laughs> and, and, and I do love that of like everything has got to be this flowery language mm-hmm. of just of just like nothing's ever just like, yeah, some dead witches are here. Yeah. <laughs> and McGinley McGinley's character, I mean, Stan just very often his character just goes off into what sound like pre-rehearsed wrote man's man spiels that I'm not even sure how much Stan believes them at this point. <laughs> They're like reactionary things that come out of his mouth when, conf- you know, every time Evie answers a question with a question and he just mm-hmm. mm, personal foul, <laughs> like it's, he's it on like it, a right defense th- mechanism. Yeah. For him, really. Yeah. And, and I've got older, I mean, I've got older family members that, that do that every once in a while of like, Oh crap, I said the wrong word in this conversation. And now you're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> Like I, I've, I've triggered a subject for you. Uh, and that's how Stan sounds on so many things. And it's, it's hysterical given the basis of the premise of the show and how he's alive. Right. Like the very fact that he's retiring as sheriff uh, undercuts all of his man's man uh, stuff. He's only alive because of his wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, <laughs> I don't say I'm just kind of surprised no one just shot him for that anyway. Just like just a random you know, oh, yeah. crime happen. I mean, I, I do love that the writers obviously know. And this one, this uh, series is written. Like, I, actually, it's interesting how much they they sell it on the writer. Like, it's like, hey, it's one of the writers of The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. No, this thing, uh, they seem to hang this entire show off Dana Gould's name for better or worse. All the ads I saw mentioned him. And I can see why, though, because when I think of the show and I think of Stan's character specifically, I think of all these monologues that he has that are, you know, they're written in a way that I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a writer that saw John C. McGinley and said, I can write big, long speeches for this guy Mm -hmm. and he'll sell them no matter what it's. Oh, yeah. You can have him read situation it is. You you could have him read anything in any situation. The length of esoteric screaming that he did in Scrubs and, and, and makes work. Like, he makes those crazy-ass monologues work uh, when they should just be, like, a one-line insult and he'll go off for 15 minutes. Yeah, and, and you could definitely tell, yeah, somebody saw that and went, that actor can say anything I put in his mouth. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's great because he can do each one, and each one feels distinctly different. Mm-hmm. Even though, like, even when they're bringing up you know previously mentioned arguments, he still makes it seem new. Yeah, and it's 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 very interesting the way he can do it. And of course, we uh, in the opening we see Janet Varney's character uh, Evie tied to a stake, uh, asking Stan for help. And of course, he's just like, "Why did you like? Why did you tie yourself to a stake? <laughs> I didn't." I didn't. Why would anyone... Ah, you know what? Never Excuse mind. Just 28 years. I never got once tied to a stake. You're here it's, one week. 28 one... years. <laughs> How do you make it 28 years at this job, honestly? Well, that's well, exactly well, it. His wife, he didn't. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking the whole town oh shit. I'm God, talking yeah. literally. How did this town survive him for 28 years? <laughs> you think, <laughs> you'd think they replace him eventually. Yeah. But, like, how did he not do something stupid to get them get rid of him? Yeah, there's no way that he's not slapped a child in the street. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, we see uh, the female demon show up behind him. Uh, he gets off a one-liner of her looking like a, a barrel of assholes. <laughs> Jeez, lady. Anybody ever tell you you look like a barrel of assholes? Which is a great insult that I kind of want to use now. I don't know what I, I would like, advise against it. What is it about a barrel of assholes that I find so amusing? It's I feel like somebody in the room went, "Well, we can't say bag of dicks." Yeah, <laughs> so they switch it up, like barrel of switch assholes. The format, yeah. and then of course he gets he gets this uh, the shit get knocked out of him, and I do love the the physicality of like the standard hit to the point where you can even see him leaning into the hit. About to like flip himself over, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, well, and he lands on the ground with a really great. Like they follow through with an ow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then we cut back to the. Well, actually, first we get the opening, the actual intro opening of right. you know the title s- sequence. I didn't pay as much attention to the title sequence the first time I watched it, but I did earlier today rewatching it, and I really like the amount of town backstory and setup that they do in a very quick amount of time with the. Uh, newspaper headlines one after mm-hmm. another they they ran through uh both 
some really nice previously on, you know, here's the setup, but they also set the tone really well when they clip through some of those newspaper headlines of like, uh, sheriff forcibly retired after altercation at funeral. Uh, I forgot what the quote is, but like local man says sheriff plum flipped out or something like he went plum crazy or some redneck saying, <laughs> and, uh, and then like local man says cloud looks like dump truck. <laughs> is one of the other headlines and then but then the next headline in larger point type is new sheriff a woman yes like yeah. <laughs> they made sure you knew that one wow like there's there's so many little tiny things of like oh this is that town all right yeah <laughs> yeah you expect one of the news clippings to be like and a colored family moved in next door mm-hmm. like yeah you, we're, we're probably five years off that in that paper maybe yeah it's just <laughs> It, it's you get a real sense of like oh okay <laughs> i know the setting now <laughs> and it's great because uh it's got like you know this over like over kind of scratchier filter over the top of it everyone you know even the side characters get their own little moment to show in it like you know the the deputy and stan's daughter because they they're, they're very important like sub characters as well mm. that show up very that show up very uh, uh a lot yeah. and it's a it's it's an interesting opening no the reason i like the the opening in medias res is because you think like okay well that's to show us the tone of the show and to show us a little action so that we know that it's coming so that we can get through the you know the normally slower opening right you got to build up the town you got to build up the characters so you know we, and then we see a funeral so we're kind of ready for a somber kind of scene mm-hmm. with stan to you know establish some character you know general story stu- structure stuff what i'm not ready for is for stan to get like to see the same demon woman it, and like right across the the casket who starts to kind of like flirt, flirt with them yeah yeah it, and of course, normally this would be uh, in another show. He'd be like, "Oh, that's weird. Uh, maybe I, I should feel uncomfortable." But, but because this is Stan, this is John C. McGinley. He just ru- he just like, <laughs> "Hey, you! What the fuck are you looking at? Like, you want to go? <laughs> yeah." <laughs> and well, he- he's already looked at the minister of like, uh, or as we all all of his friends call him Stan, and he shoots a side eye look at the minister, Stanley. Sheriff Miller. (laughs) You're only going to call him those names if you want to lose your fingers. Like, he was ready to just like... watching the preacher back all the way up to, like, Sheriff. (laughs) Sheriff. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, no, he... I mean, he gets the lady in a headlock across the casket. I think the minister falls into the hole. Like, that funeral goes off the rails so quick. (laughs) And I think we get my, like, favorite line of the episode. Just like, Dad, why can't we have a nice funeral? (laughs) Yeah, can't we just have a nice funeral? (laughs) Yeah, because I can't imagine what everyone else has seen. Like, I immediately wanted to know, like, like what does the rest of the town see happen? Probably just sees an old lady. Probably just well, an old lady, yeah. Well, even then, we don't really get the sense that Stan is like, he says, like, did someone put you up to this? The, mm-hmm. the way this dialogue sounds, I don't know if he think if he knows that she's a demon no, or oh, i don't think she he, does i don't think he does yeah no, i think he just thinks that i don't like this old lady let me go kick the shit out of her yeah no people suck and they're trolling me at a, yeah <laughs> yeah i think he just thinks people are trolling him at his funeral or at his wife's funeral i don't think he thinks it's a demon i think he's just straight beating an old lady's ass yeah which is so from that i was like oh i did not see this scene going this mm-hmm. place this is this was fun and unexpected so after that he is of course forcibly retired and we meet our the what I who I like to call the actual protagonist of Stand Against Evil, and, ironically, <laughs> uh, and Evie, played by Janet Varney, comes yes. into the sheriff's station, and I love Evie because I like to think that the show is named Stand Against Evil only because Stan is easier to make into a pun mm-hmm. than Evie, because Evie is the only one that has like you know likable character traits that actually goes through uh, a, an amount of character growth through she, the season. She's the one that she looks like she could be a real person, not just a parody of a person. Or is, is at least trying to be active during a lot of the casework in future episodes hmm. where Stan is doing a lot of trying to not, like, eh, I don't really want to do all that much work. <laughs> she reminds me of when Nick Angel first shows up to the small town in Hot Fuzz. Yeah. Like, when he's suddenly the only real cop like who really care like when she walks into the sheriff's office and it it's buzzed lights and like chair flipped over i mean it looks like it's been ransacked mm-hmm. and and she just like oh okay 
Like you could see her reassessing like, this is what I'm going to have to do. But but you can tell she's going through real stuff people think about walking into real jobs. Like I feel like Evie walked in and went, all right, I'm going to have to get this paperwork in order and we're going to have to make this. Fun. Like she's a real sheriff. She's doing about to do her job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, this is the thing. Like, I, I hope we can get Janet on at some point again uh, mm-hmm. for this podcast as well, because I would like to ask her when she has scenes like this in the opening where she's dealing with Stan for the first time. There's moments in her acting where it's very, it feels very real of like when he's being very dismiss- dismissive mm-hmm. of her, and I, I just feel like a lot of that rings true of like, so how many times have you had to like go through this in like your real life? Because this. It's the natural reaction. Because there's a lot of her pushing down, just like not really responding to Stan and just kind of pushing down her obvious distaste for this man in order to get the job done. Yeah, I think at one point later she calls him out of like, did you risk both our lives just to prove a point, prove I'm wrong? (laughs) And he immediately like, there it goes. Question with a question. (laughs) Who the hell are you? I could ask you the same question. Of course you could. That's what women do. You ask them a question, then they answer your question with a question. But did they ever answer your question? No, 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 no. Because that'd be a sign of weakness. Am I right? Are you Sheriff Miller? Huh? You just did it again, didn't you? He's the worst. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> and so, and it turns out Stan's been living there. Yes, yeah, he hasn't been home. The moments where she asks, there are several moments where, where a character asks John C. McGinley about something personal like that like have you been home since your wife's funeral things that don't belong in a sitcom and he just kind of breaks down yeah and they're they're subtle small i mean it's it's the benefit of getting a really good actor who is also really funny that mcginley legitimately gets some quiet moments across without breaking the the humor of the scene no and and this is like one of the it's basically the only moment in the episode, or no, there's another moment later mm-hmm. that we'll talk about, but there's only a couple moments, even in the, in the rest of the episodes, too, that he gets to be come across as even just a little bit sympathetic. Mm-hmm. And because he sells those moments when he when he does, like he gets the most out of them he can, we do end up like, I think on a different show I, uh, with a different actor, I might ha- end up hating Stan uh, just outright, just outright yeah. and not liking watching him. Right now, I just like I'm like, man, I hate Stan, but I love watching this guy. He's <laughs> yeah. so great to f- watch his awful behavior. Yeah. Instead, I get I get a feeling off of McGinley that that Stan is a character who desperately wants this fake, not real dichotomy of like men do man things. And I come home and there's dinner ready and I sit and watch TV and ignore you. And like he desperately wants that Archie Bunker life and. And you you get the feeling through the whole episode that he he knows he may not have known what was happening, but he knows he's never had that and that that's not real and that that these compulsive things he says are to put up an illusion like this is purely to try to talk himself into believing that, like, I'm just dealing with like an abnormal, stupid person problem today. But this isn't really my life. My life is a normal. I'm going to go home and crack a beer. And that's never been Stan's life. And so I, 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 I love that McGinley manages to get across the, the sense that, that even Stan is kind of doing this just as a defense mechanism to hang on. I, I really don't feel like his heart is even in half this stuff. Like, these feel like arguments he knows he lost 20 years ago. Like, and you women with your blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I do like, I actually really like that insight to that, to his character too, because it explains a lot later for his inaction during a lot of the other episodes, if you view it as him not just being lazy and not wanting to be active, but not wanting to sh- break down his illusion any more than it already is mm. of having of being this normal of having this normal life, like no, I don't want to go on a crazy adventure that that would prove more to me that my wife was not who I thought she was. Yeah, he does not want to pick at this. It's 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 weird, but it's not weird. Like you you get there's there's a couple episodes later where I mean he just literally like stays at home. Like, nope, not leaving the chair. Yeah, Just and it's... going to watch TV. It's like one of those scenarios where people will convince themselves of anything if they need to believe it. Yeah. You know, like, for it to be true. Like, they need it to be true for them. And it's one of those things where you're, when you're on the outside looking in, it's like, oh, that's really sad. Yeah. So, <laughs> I do love that he... This is where we get the point of Evie and Stan's relationship. It gets set up in the beginning right here. And it's, I mean... 
Stan tries to cram as much sexism as he can into like one, you know, monologue. So like, like in, as much into one sentence at, at one point than he, than, than uh, I've ever seen any character try and do. Man, he's like, pushing it. This is where this is where he starts the whole like, ah, oh, can't a- you can't just answer my question. You got to answer my question with a question mm. thing. Starts and yeah, it's great because when he gets back home, uh, we meet the other female character of his life, his daughter. Yeah, Denise. And Denise is great. <laughs> Denise is amazing. Yeah. She actually might be my favorite character of the show. Deborah Baker Jr., the actress that plays Denise, walks this perfect line of Denise isn't stupid. Like she's not she's not She seems more oblivious. So weird she's but she is so eccentric. And the tiny little quirky things that end up happening with Denise, I mean, it, even when they get, I mean, they give her some of her own subplots later, but but even in the pilot, tiny things like her being back at the house, and and we know that Stan hasn't been home in three days, and she says, "Dad, you know, you haven't you haven't been here since the funeral. I'm starving. All I had, <laughs> all I had, were some goldfish at the at the funeral at the wake, and like." You're a grown person. <laughs> That's but, my exact thought. But like, she just leaves it like I haven't. I mean, like, it very much implied that like Denise has simply not eaten in three days because, just because, <laughs> just because no one was there to make it for her. Yeah. yeah. It, and to describe this scene and how ridiculous it, it, ridiculous it is because of her age, let me describe the how we meet her and you picture in your mind how old you think this person is. Stan opens the door to his daughter's room. Uh, she's in the rocking chair listening to, to headphones blocking out the world. She's got her pink unicorn t-shirt mm. on uh, oh, with, a, with a little white sweater over it. And she and she says like, Dad, you, you've been gone. There's you've been gone. There's like you've gone for like days. I'm hungry. Like, and I'm just like, OK, this dialogue is written for like maybe even a 12 year old. Although I know a lot of 12 year olds that can feed Would themselves. still be more sufficient than this. Yeah. <laughs> and well, the and they do. A, you're like 34 is ridiculous. And they do a Norman Bates like psycho setup too. Like they have Stan creep into the room thinking there's a home intruder, and so he just nearly shoots her. Oh Jesus Christ! Oh, oh hey! You you, you want to get shot? No, I don't ever want to get shot. And I love her reaction to that. Like like him. Did you want to be, be shot? shot? <laughs> and her absolutely earnest no. I, I, don't, I never want to get wanna shot. shot. <laughs> It's it's her earnestness at, in the face of everything that's just wonderful. It's like no, that would be awful. <laughs> we actually did get a little bit of a scene, another one of those little kind of small side moments with Stan before this too, mm-hmm. uh, where he he walks into the house and like hangs up his keys and like yeah. next to his wife's keys. Yeah, and I saw something this scene that I don't know if it was important or not, but his wife's keys uh, had a lucky rabbit's foot on it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I noticed that his wife's keys have the lucky rabbit's foot. Yeah, it's it's not a direct link to an episode like it's not foreshadowing for a specific episode mm. later but it is indic it's an indicator of her um Just you know other life other yeah. life yeah of you know charms and stuff like uh and we see that in uh in a later scene because they mention that they need to get some insurance information mm-hmm. well i think it was her life insurance paper li- yeah thing and it's in her sewing room yeah, and it's in her sewing room that they're they're not allowed in. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another touching moment with McGinley where he he looks at the daughter and they have a little moment of like, can you imagine your mom picturing us going through her sewing room? Like, there's there's a little moment of like nobody ever goes in that room and mm-hmm. and it, again, it's just a it's a tiny, immediately available bonding moment that just because McGinley could pull it off it, in the hands of another actor, it would have just not been noticed. I would have I would that line would have not landed like that. It's great because my father passed away, you know, recently and I had the I had such a it was so weird. I had such a similar uh, thing. I watched this. I actually watched this first episode before before uh, my dad passed mm. away. So rewatching it again, I, I watched this scene with a whole new context and that conversation that between the da- a daughter and a father, I had the exact conversation between my mom uh, with my mom. And it, we remembered something that dad would do. We both smiled and then we both got sad again yeah. Yeah. because that memory now, all your memories now are bittersweet mm-hmm. and they're all past tense and they're, and they're experiencing that for the first time and it's all still raw. Yeah. And th- I don't know, that moment feels so real to me. It's so odd in a, in a show that later 
where people will get spewed on with bile. But and, it, like, it's the scene we already saw someone fight over a casket. Like, yeah. Yes. That's a thing we've already seen in the show. Well, it's a very real thing to have. I mean, we've all had the that revision of memory of of like, oh, now I have to revisit that. You know, now that memory is is twinged with something different, and it it's interesting to have that moment in a real small way here in a show where that's about to happen in a big goofy way. I mean, because he when he goes into the sewing room, um, the way they've arranged the room basically, if you just were to open the door and look in, you'd see you would have seen his wife at, at her desk at her sewing desk. But if you step into the room and shut the door, the whole other wall is medieval <laughs> weaponry. And and so not a minute after the the touching small scene, you get Stan having kind of a big goofy revision of his entire life of like, oh Claire, what were you up to? <laughs> it's like finds out that his wife was Buffy. <laughs> Basically. And that's like that's the twist of the show is that he is his wife was this person that was keeping the town basically and him mostly specifically him. safe. <laughs> So, yeah, he did marry Buffy the Vampire Slayer, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's it's interesting watching a show that's all about... It's actually... It's it's more about her. Like, it's like it's about, like, this character that we only hear about and sometimes see in flashback. Hmm. Yeah, it's like a whole show about picking up the, the void left by Buffy being gone. Because... Like, and, and I'm not even sure that... I bet they, I mean, I, they probably won't go into it. I think it would dispel a lot of the romance of it, but I would really wonder what the courtship was like. There's no way that McGinley lucked into meeting her. She is a witch from this town and he took a cursed position. I'm willing to bet she married whoever the sheriff was. Like when, when he became sheriff, I marrying him and, and deciding to stay with him and protect him is the only way he was going to survive. I feel like at some point in their courtship, she took the reins of that of like, nope, I'm sticking with you because you're going to die otherwise. That's very interesting. Mm. I, he's in a cursed position and, and she she just happens to be the person that could help him. You know, I I I see why you wouldn't want to do that scene because it would dispel a little bit of I, I think mystery, it would. I mean, and I'm, I'm spitballing, but I, like, I feel like it's more likely that she sought him out than he looked but, into her. I do want to see that scene now because I think it would add an important element of you want to know why someone would fall for Stan. I want to know why someone would take his job. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it, you want to see the relationship and see why if if it's just maybe even just a small conversation to why these two connected because right now you do you, you are so far removed from who that Stan probably even was. So it's hard to it's hard to believe that he even was a person that anyone could fall in love with at oh, any you, point. Yeah, but there was a courtship and Stan took her on dates. <laughs> yeah. Like where who is that guy? I've never we've not met that Stan. Well I guess my biggest thing is that I don't obviously you guys have watched the rest of the season, so mm-hmm. I'm just spitballing here because I don't actually know one way or the other. But uh do we actually know that she was like trained like this before she met Stan? Actually, that is a. I, I don't want to spoil okay. it for you because I want to. We'll talk about it when we get to that episode. All right. Yeah. But yeah. there, there is an episode where we go a little bit more. Well, actually, there's a couple. There's a couple more episodes too. But there is an episode where we get an actual flashback to mm. her, and it's it. That's interesting, and it's kind of like a slow reveal of what her deal basically was. Okay. Because just watching this episode, I'm like, okay, so. Was she Buffy and then she met this guy or was she, did she meet this guy, fall in love with him and then someone tried to kill him and then she decided. And then she had to to become. Yeah. yeah, Then she became Buffy to save him. Yeah. And that's not really definitively answered. Like that's, I mean, I like Les's theory. Like Mm. that would be how I read it, but it also could go another way. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, it's not firmly established. I don't think. So maybe we'll we'll revisit that once we hit season two. Maybe okay. they'll actually go into that a little more. Because I actually like learning about... The, I actually like the wife as a mystery aspect. Mm. I actually like that aspect of the show a lot. Because it allows them to do episode of the week. But we also get to learn more about her as kind of the through narrative. But yeah, uh, <laughs> I think it was... Uh, it's either after or before the, the sewing room scene that Evie meets Na- uh, the, the deputy. I think it was before. Uh, Leon Drinkwater, played by Nate Mooney. Leon yeah. drink water. Now, if you think Stan is insulting to women, Woo! Stan Stan is gruff and lovable. Uh, Leon needs it's the living shit beat out spanny. of him. I cannot believe that this man has not been fed his own teeth at this point. Like that, that just no random person's ever punched him. It's <laughs> like, well, straight up, the only reason that he's deputy 
is that his parents own the building and Stan says, if, if I fire him as deputy, I will have to move the entire sheriff's department into the fire station. And then he proceeds to go on a rant about how firemen aren't heroes. Uh, but <laughs> I forgot about that. Since when does pointing a hose at something make you a hero? Like, it's just it's no. so random. Like, just shut up. Stop. Like, the deputy uh, literally comes with the building. Like, it's like. Yes. And so, yeah, right. deputy Drinkwater comes with the building and his. His insults to Evie in first meeting her are like, oh, there she is. There's the lady who has, whose husband left her. Like, yeah. wow. What the fuck? I'm as good as dead, and I shouldn't enter the pie contest. Mm. There she is. There's the woman whose husband left her. What? Like, <laughs> who? That was the one that killed me, because he he was passive aggressive before. It was like, the pie so eating. Passive aggressive. Yeah, you don't want to enter the pie eating contest, because you might win, and then no one wants to think you're the big shot that wants to, you know, but impress you know what? everybody. You enter that pie eating contest. You you live life while you can, yeah. sweetie. Like, because yeah, this is the you're, best you're ever going to get because you're a woman. Like, oh, my God. Like, like Stan stretches the the boundary of like, oh, ha, ha, you're a different generation. Leon just needs to shit beat out of him. Mm-hmm. Like, you well, cannot believe. He's also believe- the one that introduces the fact that she's going to die. Yes. I- oh, yeah. No, tells her flat out, you're cursed. Deputy's the job you want. Yeah, except for he doesn't even say it that right. He just says, you're going to die. And it's like, and she just yeah. like immediately takes that like a threat because, yeah, yeah. someone just told her she was going to die. Oh, yeah. well, uh, you just threatened the, not only your superior officer, but uh, a, a uh, officer of the law. You're fired. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I, I mean, after he gets that, oh, like, I mean, there's the woman whose husband left her. That I mean, people shouldn't say that out loud. No. You should burst into, fu- into flame when you, if you say something like yeah. that out loud. Well, like, and... The, <laughs> The subplots that happen to Leon later in the season are are spectacular. It's not it, dependent on any of the other characters. But the the kind of stuff that Leon gets into is like I believe he ends up as uh being blackmailed by a like a Russian dominatrix or like he he ends up either buying a, a mail order wife or something just something just it, his backstory gets sadder and more bizarre in the background of scenes to the point where like if Leon walks through the back of a scene like oh god what's he up to now. <laughs> well, he, I love he might as well be wearing a sign as just that I'm being written as the most unbelievable douchebag so that we can do horrible stuff to my character and you won't care. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, the stuff he says on a regular basis is, I mean, it, it feels like uh, what a Reddit commenter would put on or like mm-hmm. or someone on 4chan. It's He does. A, it, he feels a little bit like a living Reddit comment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, he kind of gives her the skinny on uh, the sh- sheriff's position being basically cursed. Right. On how if you take a position in, sh- in this town as sheriff, your days are numbered. Uh, the only one who's made it to a ripe old age to retirement has been Stan. And no one's really sure why. So that leads us into uh, our next scene, which is, uh, <laughs> I mean, Evie meets up with the old woman from the funeral uh, which is a great reveal because, of course, she's standing behind uh, our deputy <laughs> drink water. I can't say his name without laughing. Mm-hmm. Deputy drink water. Like, that's such a redneck name. <laughs> it really is. Aren't you just a tall drink of water? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the demon lady is standing behind him. And I always love that. Like, how is that set up like in a real life scenario? Hey, let me like uh, I just brought this person in. Uh, they're standing right behind me in the, in a perfect way so that they can be revealed in like this dramatic fashion. <laughs> like, like, do you think is that? I mean, in real life, that would take coordination. Do you think they like teamed up before they walked into the room? Like, you want to walk right into like new guy? <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, like I'm, o- I've always been fascinated on how that happens. And of course, the you know she's a demon because she's got her hunt. Why? Why do all? Why does all demon acting have like the hunched shoulders? Where her shoulders, like, it makes it look like, okay, so I'm a demon, and everyone, every person that ever has played a demon is like, demons don't have necks. No necks, like, just all demons have scoliosis. Like, don't be everybody's hun- Everybody hunches like a crone, yeah. Like, their their posture is always fucked up. It's always, it's always messed up. You're being insensitive right now. They have scoliosis. <laughs> So yeah, no, uh, I I just love how she greets her. It's like you must be the new constable. And I'm just like constable. I, my first reaction is, how old are they? Oh wait, that's right. right. Nick talks like this, so never mind. <laughs> I don't. I, even I haven't used the word constable. I love how everybody. Sure, yeah. I mean, Drinkwater does it, and so does the old lady. Uh, they they mention her photos on her desk without really looking at them in a creepy yeah. way. 
Like she doesn't come around her desk and look at the photo. She just she's still looking at the sheriff in the eyes and goes, "Oh, is that your daughter?" Like, I know that photo's on my desk, but that's some weird shit to say. Mm-hmm. Like, just don't mention my family, weirdo. Yeah. I mean, after that, I would stop putting pictures of my family near the desk. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I. I, I, I'm like, okay, whatever uh, solace I take from seeing the face of my child, it's not worth this creepy commentary that I keep getting. No. Although, it would be even creepier is that, like, next time when she takes the pictures off, the next person comes in like, is that your child? We're like, the fuck? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do like the fact that the, uh, or no, we, we have a scene before that because it actually cuts back to uh, Stan. D- Stan and Denise mm-hmm. for a little bit. Because Stan is wondering uh, about the book that uh, apparently his wife was was reading. Right, and also like how this happened. Yeah, and... Uh, and it reveals how oblivious he's been in his mm-hmm. marriage. Because even Denise knows way more about this than him. Yeah, she doesn't know the specifics, but she's like, yeah, well, yeah. it's probably when mom went out. And- oh, it's mom's necklace book. Like, oh yeah, no, no, she, you know her big necklace? Like, she read that book with the necklace? She always had it together? Before she went out, after you... Like, she knows all this stuff, and, and I love his incredulous, like, how did I not know this? Because you just came home and sat down and went to sleep? And then he goes off on a rant about, like, oh, well, yeah, because that's the right way that the world should be. Like, you know, you think I want to listen to you two talking, you're so insert Like, dude, you are specifically asking what we talked about. Right. And yeah. the thing that you then compulsively can't help but say, well, I wouldn't want to listen to it, though. Like... <laughs> Although we that do. also makes, like, you know, the daughter seem, like, super oblivious, too, where it's like, wait, you, you knew your mother was going out with some sort of, like, she just weird care. thing, yeah. and you just you never cared enough to even figure it out. Like, yeah. that makes her almost as bad. I mean, she's not as bad as Stan. Well, but she's, she's close. She's, she's, she's a doing hop, the, skip, and a jump, and away. <laughs> and the whole time they're having this conversation, it should be mentioned, you, you don't see what she's watching on the TV, but she's watching some kind of Jane Fonda workout yeah. of, like, I, like and I think her last line at the end is, like, I'm going to get those buns. <laughs> she's sitting there doing like side crunches and she- <laughs> want those buns <laughs> so yeah i do love that uh stan is so invested in his own illusion that like he even when asking trying to figure it out he he still will like sabotage his own investigation yeah he's just like no no i changed my mind don't really want to find out yeah and, and anyway we we cut back to evie with the uh with the old woman she transforms into a demon and asks for uh, the seeing stone, I believe she calls yeah, it, yes. which is, uh, of course, uh, the necklace mm-hmm. that we've, yeah, uh, w- we've established before. And it's weird that she asks Evie for it. Yeah. Like, I, I would well, think... actually, would you bother asking Stan for it? I mean, I guess... Well, I mean, she she already fucked with Stan and, and like, he... Maybe she's worried he wouldn't she wouldn't get the chance to ask him because like oh he's just gonna beat the shit out of me. (laughs) Like (laughs) (laughs) All right, sorry about that guys, but we had a a little bit of a technical difficulty. Uh, Les was actually kidnapped by a witch demon. Uh, so he will not be joining us for the rest of the episode as we finish up here. We had to put him on a stake. We had to put. <laughs> we had to. We had to hit him with a pipe to the head, Travis. Mm-hmm. That was the that was the whole thing. Uh, but don't worry, he will be back for episode D, and we uh, we're gonna finish up here by uh, finishing up the episode. Now, where were we? Oh yes, we were at. <laughs> Why'd you ask the question if you already knew the answer? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I was I was trying to embody the audience of like where were what were they talking about again? And they were just listening. They well, should know by now. No, they have a short attention span. I I know our audience, uh, but actually it's a brand new audience. Episode one. I'm not sure. Maybe they have short attention spans. I don't know. But uh, anyway, where we were was uh, in the sheriff's office with the witch threatening Evie, mm-hmm. uh, telling her to get the talisman from uh, Stan's wife, Claire's room. And I like this because it really does make me think, like, because we just learned in a previous scene that the sheriff's position is haunted. Cursed. Like they're, yeah, the position itself is cursed. And I, I love it. I feel like Ernest P. Worrell is going to come out of uh, the out of the side of one of the scenes. Is like, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the plot to my movie. Ernest scared stupid. <laughs> so, Shh. except nope. mine, uh, I just got to curse where my uh, ancestors were got dumber and dumber. I'm not sure if this one's better or worse. Then I have no idea. I, I don't know which one I would prefer. 
Um, I don't know. I feel like I'd live pretty, uh, pretty okay in this world. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I feel like there's a, a simple happiness to be Ignorance found here. Ignorance is bliss type of thing. Stan's, Stan and Evie seem very upset and not very happy mm-hmm. with their positions. But yeah, we need this talisman. And I do like that she does call up Stan like, uh, do you know that woman you beat up at the funeral? Mm-hmm. I think she just attacked me in her office. Now, what kind of weird, strange conversation is that to have on the phone? <laughs> like, well, at this point in the show, it actually is weird for Stan, but we'll fix that in later ones. Yeah. Uh, oh, actually, no, he doesn't call her. I, I forgot because we, we skipped over one of my favorite scenes where Stan is up working on the roof. Uh, mm-hmm. Because he wants to watch TV, but the TV is out. It's like, oh, what? All I want to do is nothing, and I can't even do that. And so he goes up onto the roof to fix uh, the and satellite. Him. And then the witch comes out of fucking nowhere. Just, just like a boo, basically. Like, hey, Stan, how's it going? Oh, Jesus. And he falls over. But but oh, but God, he, doesn't, he doesn't fall quite alone because no. he, he takes a little bit with him because he... Which he ends up grabbing the witch's arms and her skin just fl- slides right oh, off. That's so gross. Oh, what like, an effective practical effect, though. It pretty know, effective, effective practical effect. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's just like these weird fleshy gloves, and it's like, oh, it's so gross. Ugh. It made me gag. It honestly did. I don't know what it is about skin that makes me all weird, but like well, it's other. It's not supposed to come off for one, not like that. Sure, but I can watch people explode or like heads get cut off or like people get eviscerated. Mm-hmm. But something about being skinned is just like. It's just kind of nauseating, yeah. It's just not, I don't know, it does not sit right with me. So this, this effect was doubly effective on me, I think. But yeah, then he hits the f- he hits the ground, and that's when Evie comes up and tells him about the attack in, in her office. <laughs> and <laughs> she doesn't bother like asking if he's okay at all, or even like acknowledging his situation or why the fuck he's holding skin. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like that'd be a question you'd ask. Yeah, and so I do love this because even even then, Stan is on the ground going like, "Oh, it's your office now." Mm-hmm. He just can't help himself. I think Evie's like, uh, I'm starting to think that we might be kind of cursed. And <laughs> I love that Stan's like, well, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> what was it like? Yeah, do this, do that. Has it even consider- occurred to you that uh, to ask me why I'm laying face down in my yard <laughs> holding two bags of skin? Ugh. No, 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 no. <laughs> but it's all about you, isn't it? Uh, I love it. He even gives her like some of the skin. Like, here's a souvenir for you. <laughs> yeah, just- kind of hands it to her so (laughs) i do love this because we do have to get a call from uh or no we have to cut over to uh karen who is the babysitter Mm -hmm. for evie's daughter and it's uh he she gets a she's on the phone and she gets a knock on the door and who should it be but the witch from uh the the earlier scene scene. yeah and it's she's pretending to be grace's grandmother (laughs) he's like hi i'm grace's grandmother May I come in? <laughs> now with those teeth, you can't. And I, I like this because, of course, it's it's something that, like, barely... Like, it should not work at all. No. And in fact, it's later, such a tropey thing. In fact, later, it, like, it, sh- it shows that... Uh, it, or at least we get to hear that it actually didn't work. No. She, surprisingly, she doesn't fall for the trope. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, I do... We cut over to uh, Stan digging up his wife's grave... <laughs> And Evie is like, uh, what are you doing? Like, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm digging up my wife's grave. Uh, may I ask why? Uh, no reason. <laughs> and he's really looking for uh, the talisman that, e- that uh, Evie's That's looking for. That's necessary for the witch. Yeah. yeah, it turns out that they have buried it with, uh, with Claire. Whoops. So they need to get that back. It, it becomes readily apparent that Evie is starting to get suspicious of like, hey, why weren't you killed like all the years you were in office? And uh, it's like, oh, well, you know, this might have something to do with it. And Stan shows her the room full he of... He brings her back from digging up the grave to show her the room. Yeah, he, <laughs> which is really funny because he literally takes a break of the thing he needs to do. <laughs> and once again, showing that, yeah, Claire was basically the best Slayer ever. So, Eve, yeah, so it's basically, you know, shows her the Buffy room. Uh, and Evie's like, oh, my God, so your wife was keeping you alive. <laughs> and it's like... Yeah, and Stan's like, what does he say? Something about Starsky and Hutch. That's right, he's like... I ain't been in here since that gay cop show was on. What gay cop show? Starsky and Hutch. Uh, 
Starsky and Hutch weren't gay. Oh, Guy sweater had a belt. Give me a break. You're a cop. Read the signs, would you? Oh, uh, Stan, you are special. Uh, all right, Stan. Uh, or hey, look at this over here. Not until you admit Starsky and Hutch were gay. Mm-hmm. Would you just come over here, man. This this whole relationship between them, these two. It's um uh, a lot of these, a lot of things on the show have to like grow to, to the place where they need to be. Mm-hmm. I think Stan and Evie's relationship pretty much starts off exactly where it should be yeah like this contention kind of thing where they just kind of have instant chemistry that i i re- really like or uh, enmity whatever depending on how you look at it <laughs> yeah and this is where they find out about uh the witch whose name apparently was stella stannis <laughs> and it says that her last words before she was burned alive on the stake was a curse on all future constables of willard's mill we kind of figured that part out already. Yeah. And uh, this is where we get to see uh, Claire's book, which is written in what Stan calls ass backwards Mex- Mexican cha cha talk. So That's an amazing line, okay? It's so racist. It's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's, and a, it's yet, terrible. I don't know. It's something about how Stan delivers, like, just like this cha, like, ah, oh, damn. Dr. Cox, when did you get so racist? So funny, though. And. I do like, like, oh, I suppose we need to get Claire's ne- necklace. Uh, and, oh, okay, where is it? Oh, well, funny you should mention <laughs> that. God, he's so fucking spiteful. He is literally putting his own life on the line just to be spiteful. It's amazing. <laughs> so, you, I just like, so you, why did you say something? So you didn't say anything just to prove, just to prove that you were right and it's like, well, you women, oh, you women, you always got to be right. Uh, I have to be right. I have to be right. <laughs> it's important that I'm right. <laughs> well, as long as you admit it. <laughs> so I do love that he is such a jerk that he takes time out of his, what's a, a task that will save both of their lives. But, well, thing is that it's only his life that's important and he doesn't really seem to care too much. I just like he he won't even they won't even continue until he gets Evie to admit that she was wrong. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's important I'm right. I gotta be right this week, next week. Or you month, risked year. both of our lives just to tell me I was wrong. Personal foul. You just did it again. I asked you a question. You answered my question with a question. You were wrong. Try it on for size. See, see if you can say it. I was wrong, and for the Daily Double, include Starsky and Hutch were gay. Go ahead. Well, give, give that a try. You can't even do it. You can't. You can't. <laughs> I love it. Uh, it's like, God, this is so fucking ridiculous. Let's just go back and, and, and dig up the fucking grave. Because that's the normal part of the situation. But first, Evie's got to call her sitter, which doesn't go gra- go great. And I love this is like Karen's like, okay, don't be mad. Don't be mad. But Grace's grandmother came over and she, she did, Grace didn't know who she was. So I tried to stop it and it didn't work out great. <laughs> and it's like, where's Grace? Uh, hey, but no, actually it's, uh, this is the actually further in because mm. after she gets the call, uh, she drives over to uh, her place. We see Karen's severed head on the front porch. On the uh, rocking chair. Somehow still talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is pretty funny because I do like the fact that she obviously, in the next scene we didn't get to see, is that she obviously just asked Grace, like, hey, Grace, is this your grandmother? No, I don't know who that woman is. Okay, you have to leave. Mm-hmm. And then that's probably when she got murdered. I was like, good on you, Karen, for not falling for that trap. Yeah. It's yeah. actually kind of surprising. Good for you. But it's like, hey, if I'm dead, how am I even talking, right? This is weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> don't realize that kind of thing. It's bad for plot. And then it's it it must be because the witch has cursed her or something or wanted her to add a little bit of an effect to yeah. the kidnapping because just be a little dramatic. She's also there to kidnap Evie and uh the the babysitter actually laughs with her during <laughs> it too. So I'm like, okay, maybe she's under her control or something. I'm not exactly sure how it works. But Evie does indeed get captured and tied to a stake. And <laughs> I do like this because this leads us to the opening of the episode where uh, Stan shows up to the the grave open grave site and finds Evie there. <laughs> it's like, hey, this is where all those people got fucking burned. <laughs> and 
I, we get the repeat of the line, like, 28 years. I was sheriff for 28 years, and I never got tied to a stake. <laughs> You're here exactly one week. And I, I just wanted Evie to be like, well, to be fair, I didn't have my wife ca- uh, carrying my ass the whole fucking 28 years. True. Uh, we get the barrel of asshole lines again, which is great. Mm-hmm. Always fantastic. Appreciate that. And... <laughs> Stella uh, just nails Stan again. We get to see the the bitch sap. Like, the cursed uh, people and witches and demons on the show, they all seem to have enhanced strength. Yeah. To the point where they can, like, just slap people across rooms and just, like, just, just great feats of strength that they seem to be able to accomplish. It's a thing. But Evie gets a bright idea, which is actually pretty neat. She decides to use her position as sheriff to pardon Stella for all the charges of witchcraft. Will that even work? Not sure. We never really get a chance to see if it does indeed work, because then Stan comes up to behind Stella for, with a pipe to the head. <laughs> pipe to the head. Never fails. Not that I've ever done that to a suspect. That would, of course, be illegal. And he has to think about it. He has to think about it for just a half second. Illegal? <laughs> yes, Stan, that would be the word. It's like, yes, you're the sheriff. You should know that that is against the rules. Uh, <laughs> I do like that Evie tried to pardon her, though. Like, a very yeah. interesting... That's a clever workaround to, like, okay, I'm tied to the stake. What can I actually do to get out of my situation? Oh, well, let me try this. Like, there's nothing better I can do. And I don't anyone else even actually bothered to try it, so we don't know that it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. I mean, they don't try it, uh, they don't try it again, but... Hmm. <laughs> I. I do, I do appreciate the uh, the, attempt. the workaround, yeah, the, the attempt at it. So, <laughs> I do like that we... Well, I love that. The witch comes back up, mm-hmm. and she has the pipe somehow wedged into her head. Yes, it's like actually like stuck in there. Like, like it was some kind of sharp object rather than a blunt tool. No, that that's... I definitely appreciate it. It's very, it's very funny. But, like, uh, of course, also Grace is there. Uh, she gets pretty much, like, a, a, a scene of, like, of Evie going, like, oh, I'm so glad you're okay. Now go fuck off behind that tree, all right? <laughs> and just get, just get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do like that we get uh, the, the book uh, that we have to read. Like, okay, now what do we have to do? We have to encircle her in salt, the witch. And, like, well, we don't have any salt. Uh, don't be... <laughs> don't... Uh, never fret, my dear. We have Stan with... Uh, his little Condiment salt purse. Pa- little, yeah, little salt packets. And he's like, well, like, don't judge me just because I seal condiments. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I feel like we should. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, no, that's probably just an old person thing, because I'm pretty sure that if I went my dad's car, I would find that exact bag. <laughs> so, yeah, we get... I, I love that even they have really small little p- mounds of salt in mm-hmm. the circle. Like, it actually Like, shows it wasn't that, even. Like, some pr- guy in the prop department actually took a couple hours to actually put little little mm. mounds of salt mm-hmm. rather than a ring of salt around so that i actually appreciated that yeah so here we get uh the the final jump from the witch <laughs> we in uh evie you know says the incantation and the witch is gone they banish the witch and banish the them from this realm of mortals so <laughs> That that wraps up that episode, and the, we win, guys. We win. Yay, Except that victory. there's <gasps> there's 171 other demons who are determined to uh, destroy Stan and Evie. That's a very <laughs> specific number, too. But then I love Stan's the closing line: "Is eh, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> Just like I don't worry about anything." Right? He doesn't so, really seem to give a shit. So this is. A great episode. Oh, also we get a small little shot of a guy in a bird mask carrying a scythe. Which is will show up uh, later throughout the se- later throughout the season. Yeah, he's got like a really awesome like plague doctor mask. Yeah, it's pretty cool looking. Uh, and he's I just, he's got a really nice design. We see him. Uh, we'll see him later in the uh, uh, Claire's room as well. So, as far as a opening episode, as far as a you know premiere. This is really good. This is really effective. Mm-hmm. At least in my opinion. I'm not sure how you thought about it. Well, again, this is the second time I've seen it. Uh, I. I liked it then. I wouldn't say it was enough to make me like watch the whole show, mostly because of how inconvenient they made to watch the show. But it's still like really good. Yeah, it's it's really fun. I really appreciate it being twenty two minutes long. I'm not sure why it works. Like 
Because Ash for the Evil Dead is like 44 minutes and they can do more story-wise. And mm-hmm. sometimes the episodes do feel like they're a little rushed. But for the most part, I kind of like, you know what, I'm really, I'm actually really, I, I like the breeziness of how I can just plow through an episode and be done in less than a half hour. Right. I mean, this one was like, hey, you want to watch, you know, the episode, first episode of Science Evil? Like, oh yeah, we got, oh yeah, it's like 22 minutes. I don't have to spend like half my night watching like a 45 minute show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's easy to to watch and keep up with easy to digest and it's it's just real fun like it's it has a real sense of fun to it that only gets more apparent over time Mm -hmm. uh i like the effect work uh going on the acting is is just great overall i mean there's not if there's anything that uh that the uh, opening episode in the first season really that has a problem is just that the the, there's just not as many people around Mm. it just feels very small and insular but they the, definitely get a use of their characters, though. The actors that they do have, like John C. McGinley has found his niche of like the old curmudgeon. <laughs> Just cranky old man. Yeah. And Janet Varney as Evie is, you know, playing up the, the badass sheriff role, but also she has great comedic timing. Mm-hmm. So it really works off her. I really like Evie. Uh, and I like that she has to put up with Stan. <laughs> of course, Evie, is, Evie, again, is basically the main character of the show. Right. And we're really watching her deal with what uh stan has like basically refuses to deal with most of the time true denise and drink water are great uh sub characters to add in to just pop in deliver a joke and, and then be out and just like and just get right on out of here drink water is just gross though drink water is gross <laughs> i do like him though i do like that he there they have this obstacle that's just around to just deliver like a to a line that makes people feel gross mm-hmm. and just and just dip on out other than that, uh, I think this we pretty much talked this one pretty much through. I think. Uh, I don't. Know well, what do you think, Les? <laughs> what do you think, Les? Oh, Les is back. Oh, oh God! Oh, oh no! Put him down! Put him down! Oh no! 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 Okay, we're we gonna wrap this one up uh, as we run away from Les's uh, Les's corpse. Thank you guys so much for listening to this first episode of Stand Against or of Pot Against, Against Evil. Evil. Uh, we're recovering Stand Against Evil. If you would like to help out the podcast, please subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us those five-star reviews. Help us out with visibility and all that good jazz. Follow us on Facebook, uh, at Twitter, at UG, or no, at Twitter, at Pot Against Evil. <laughs> He'll get this right yeah, eventually. I'll get this right eventually. Got a yeah. whole season. So at, at Twitter, at Pot Against Evil, uh, or you can just email us at potagainstevil at gmail.com. We would love to hear your thoughts on the show and what uh, you are hoping for future seasons. And just, I don't know, stuff that we might have missed. Like, what what didn't we talk about? What hilarious thing? Like, uh, like help us get better at this. Help us help ourselves. <laughs> um, There's no of, helping you. Speaking of help ourselves, uh, we've got to deal with this less problem. All right, get... Oh, God, get the steak. Get the, no, we got to get the pipes. Get the pipes no. to the head. Okay, no, a seri- it's stuck. A series of pipes to the head. <laughs> okay, well, that's uh, unfortunate. Anyway, we're going to have to reanimate... Oh, man, we're going to have to reanimate for the next episode. Oh, shit. <laughs>